Hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the first annual conference so far. My name is Krasimir Svetanov, and I'm a graduate student at Purdue University, studying digital forensics and homeland security. I'm also a research assistant at the CyberTap program and a Forces Fellow. If you would like to contact me after this talk, my contact information is displayed on the screen. And since we had limited time during the conference, I have recorded this slightly extended version of the talk in order to provide more context. I also invite you to visit the Forces blog site where you can read more on the topic. Only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we either call ideological subversion or active measures, active neomeropriatia in the language of the KGB, or psychological warfare. I'm not using this in order to say all psyops come from Russia, but to show you how much about the Russian Cold War intelligence operations is not known by Hollywood. <laughs> Why by Hollywood? Well, because what people know about intelligence, they learned from Hollywood and James Bond and Jack Ryan, and in particular from Johnny English. Particularly Johnny English. Well, we have all heard about the infamous KGB and all the bad stuff that they have done, and yet we haven't really learned much because, according to Bezmanov, we only have seen those 15%, the tip of the iceberg. Also, imagine all those things we don't know about and the media doesn't want to tell us. Why? Well, draw your conclusions later. But for now, I want to underline that this is not a talk about Russian collusion and Russian disinformation, and there will be no attribution or guilt assignment in this talk, but rather we'll cover the media effects that are used in this type of operations. And now let's look at the targets, methods, tools, and goals. It is important to understand that the target of the operation is not the individual, but society as a whole. And the methods are designed to work on groups and exploit group dynamics and societal effects. The tools are not bots or ads, but rather they're other people who in turn influence the opinion of the masses. Those operations aim to change the attitude of the population. Just to give you an example, during the 2016 election, there was a lot of talk about Russian bots and the IRA influencing the election. Do you think that all adults, whether they knew how to computer or not, with the Python script and built a graph of Twitter bot relations and then performed sentiment analysis to understand how they are supporting, who those bots are supporting? No, it was a bunch of pundits who gave their opinion about what they see and how they think things played out. And this is what formed people's opinion. Just a spoiler alert, this is also known as two-step flow of information, which we'll cover later. But uh, think about this example and also we'll see how this may play a role in the so-called passive information operations. Next, to influence a change, an effective messaging campaign must be organized. To spread the message more efficiently, the attacker would rely on elements of communications theory. This will ensure optimal propagation and better adoption rate. In this talk, we'll focus on those. Let's start with something familiar and straightforward, the filter bubble. Although one of the newer concepts, it is well understood and very powerful. In 2005, Google launched personalized search. As a result, the engine would remember what you're searching for analyze it, and then customize all of your subsequent searches. So topics of no previous interest will be deprioritized and end up way down in your search results. In turn, you're unlikely to see any contradicting information or things that are different. Now consider the same pattern with social media like Google News, Facebook, Twitter. The resulting filter would not only prevent you from getting diverse information, but you're unlikely to see dissenting opinions and discussions, which may change your views. This in turn creates isolation and echo chambers, and is similar to agenda setting. In a way, the filter bubble shows you only the things you are already interested in and agree with, 
and filters away everything else by deprioritizing it to the point you will not see it. As an added effect, it makes the things you're interested in even more important. First, subconsciously, because you're constantly reminded about them, and second, by making them occupy dominant space in your online campus, which is we'll discuss which which we're going to discuss under cultivation effects. In extreme cases, we can uh, it can achieve self radicalization. In the past, people would wake up in the morning, pick up the newspaper, and read it before they get to the office. Of course, they would only read the first few pages, and as a result, the most important news was on the first page, then followed by less important ones and by the ones that would never get read. Sound familiar? Anyway, when people get to work or in a social setting, everyone would have a similar set of topics to discuss, and those would become the most important topics of conversation for the day. This in turn improves accessibility and memory because they are constantly reminded, and second, because it appears to be important for everyone uh, or everybody else is talking about. On top of that, we have the group dynamic and people wanting to fit in. Does that sound familiar? Note that this has nothing to do with the actual importance of the topics and even their content. It only has to do with them being accessible in memory and having a common ground to discuss with others. Agenda setting plays essential role in influence operations. On one end, it introduces a topic for further discussion, which cascades down to discussions in cafes, offices, and other social settings. And on the other, the frequency with which it is introduced determines the public's perceptions of its importance. Agenda setting may occur on many different levels. For example, the editor may decide which of the written stories to promote higher. At the same time, they prioritize the journalist's workload and which stories to cover with higher priority. Then there is the media owner who can guide the editor-in-chief's work and there are also the advertisers who can apply pressure to add revenue on the owner. Now, while agenda setting is about what content is actively pushed and prioritized for, higher, uh, for, for, for the audience to see, gatekeeping is just the opposite. This is the stories that are never told. As mentioned in the previous slide, gatekeeping and agenda setting are the two sides of a coin. While agenda setting is about introducing topics, gatekeeping is about the suppression of topics, facts and views. Like, just like agenda setting, gatekeeping can happen on different levels. From the journalist who makes the judgment what fact to omit from a story, to the editor-in-chief who blocks stories from being published. Gatekeeping is also known as censorship. When oppressive regimes suppress certain stories that are not published due to state's control. Traditionally, gatekeeping has been observed and studied in mass communication, but it can also be observed in social media. However, it is very difficult to implement unless the social media platform itself is complicit. As mentioned, gatekeeping is relatively easy to implement in traditional media such as newspapers and television. However, it is much harder to do so in social networks like Twitter. In the former, the editors and desk chiefs are easy to control choke points, and in the latter, the information routes around choke points, because people learn from other people. It is interesting to explore the flow of information in such a setting. In general, we observe two groups, content producers and consumers, which are not clearly segregated as a producer can also be a consumer and vice versa. It is observed a consumer will take the information from somebody they trust and follow, the influencer. The influencer themselves may have been influenced by another influencer, mass or specialized media. As they say, Everything is new is just well forgotten old. This two-step flow of information was first hypothesized by Lazarsfeld in the late 40s and developed further in the 50s. In this theory, what we called influencers is called opinion leaders. And it stipulates that most people do not form their opinion by direct influence by mass media, but instead they are influenced by a limited number of opinion leaders whom they trust. Those can be family, spiritual leaders, friends, and the like. Particularly interesting is the drug study discussed by Lazarsfeld, where a highly coherent group of opinion leaders, in this case medical doctors, 
formed the same medical opinion and start prescribing the same medication at approximately the same time without any prior coordination. <clears throat> well, one detail I missed is that they were all exposed to publications in a narrow set of specialized medical journals. Going back to influence operations, it appears it would be relatively easy to influence a group of doctors on any medical issue by ensuring the right articles are published in a couple of the most prestigious magazines. And even if those articles are later retracted, their influence will persist because of some of the other media effects, uh, media and cognitive effects like cultivation, which we're going to discuss later. Can you think of a real life example? As mentioned earlier, studies have discovered that it is better to use larger number of smaller scale influencers than small number of big influencers. This is because different people need a different approach. So the online modality is far more efficient because it allows custom tailoring of the messaging. In summary, the information from mass and social media appears not to be directly ingested by most of the influenced, uh, as the hypodermic needle theory suggests, but instead a two-step flow is discovered where information flows from an original source through intermediary opinion leaders, and then this information is consumed by the majority of the subjects, mainly through the power of social connections. It is important to note that other opinion leaders may influence the opinion leaders themselves, and those structures are hierarchical or peer. Because of this highly distributed system, one to many approaches like gatekeeping and agenda setting are challenging to implement and it is, it is when there is need for a decentralized or many to many approach. So meet the spiral of silence. The spiral of silence is a communications theory that explains the dynamics of expressing one's opinion in a public setting. This theory states that social groups or individuals who perceive their opinions as unpopular or losing popularity are less likely to express their opinion. This in turn reinforces the expression of contradicting opinions and leads to a spiraling effect where a particular side of an argument may not be expressed. It is important to note that this is solely a function of perception and does not need to represent the objective reality. Furthermore, this does not immediately change the opinion of people who are suppressed and Often, the perceived minority turns out to be a majority, thus the term silent majority. It takes a relatively small amount of very vocal proponents to suppress a particular uh, opinion, making it particularly easy to weaponize in an influence operation. From an influence operation point of view, this is where many bots come in handy to create noise and convince people that their opinion is not popular, thus suppress it. Another prime example of spiral of silence is cancel culture. To reinforce the effect, people who express unpopular beliefs are attacked and shamed in public. As individuals become hesitant to express themselves and the number of dissenting op opinions in the group starts to decrease, creating an echo chamber and we see cultivation effects and also groupthink. Echo chamber is a setting where no dissenting opinions are expressed. They work within a group of people and amplify a message which is already planted in that group. Thus, their usefulness is not to recruit new followers, but to solidify the beliefs of a person or a group. In extreme cases, echo chambers may even be used to radicalize the audience. From influence operations point of view, an echo chamber is useful to maintain the status quo and keep beliefs strong. In addition, examples could be far right and far left forums. In this example, the overall goal of creating an echo chamber uh, or echo chambers is to polarize society. From that point of view, it is beneficial to feed opposing view echo chambers. In addition, echo chambers are very useful for spreading propaganda. Echo chamber is not to be confused with a filter bubble, where the actor and subject is oneself. Before I continue with the remaining few media effects, I wanted to take a quick segue into cognitive science. Remember the repeating refrain of accessibility and repetition? To conserve energy and accelerate processing, the brain takes certain mental processing shortcuts known as biases. 
For example, availability is tightly related to people's ability to recall a piece of information. The easier it is for the person to remember something, the more they perceive it as important and truthful. As Tavarish Lenin said, a lie repeated many times becomes the truth. Anchoring occurs when a statement is made in the beginning and then it is difficult to move away from, from it. For example, during a negotiation, somebody may make an outlandish claim about the price of a particular item. And even if this claim is not accepted, the final negotiation will end up with a number much closer to this number than if it started with a different number. Substitution is the process where a complex question is substituted for a simplified one, and it is similar to how schemata works. Framing is when a particular concept is represented from a particular point of view with specific bias on some of the factors and not others. It is tightly related to how schemata work, and it de facto is an attempt to push a schema onto the public. Now, what schema is? Well, schema or schemata for plural is a generalized mental model which we build the first time we meet a new concept. Over time, this model may evolve, but until it does, we classify different concepts through that model. For example, a child first learns what a car is, and when it sees a truck, it calls it a big car. Similarly, a child who knows about square and circle is likely to attribute an octagon to a circle or to the circle model rather than realize that there is a superclass of polygons and in more particular equilateral polygons. Another concept I wanted to introduce is the notion of thinking fast and slow. Yes, this is also the title of an excellent layman book uh, covering the topic. This book makes the notion of us having two systems of processing. System one is fast, emotional, instructive, and unconscious. And system two is slower, logical, and methodical. For example, system one would, be, would kick in when we're driving or walking, and system two would be kicking in when we multiply large numbers or perform complex tasks, and even when we're learning to drive, but we haven't automated this behavior yet. Remember earlier we said that agenda setting pertains to what topics are discussed but has nothing to do with the way they are discussed. Priming refers to the way the media accentuates different performance characteristics and creates perceptions. While there are several types of priming, the common goal is to introduce a notion of a concept earlier in a conversation and uses the accessibility of that information in one's mind at a later time. For example, if I want to sell green energy, the best time would be to do so after rarely occurring but major disaster involving other types of energy. Or if I wanted to ban guns, then start the conversation right after a mass shooting has occurred. The term comes from priming a pump, which has to be primed first in order to work. In the same way, to have the audience associate a particular object with a particular property, the audience needs to be primed with that association first. Framing has two meanings. The first one pertains to information presentation, where certain aspects are accented and others de-emphasized, imposing a particular point of view of or frame of reference. A typical example is the proverbial glass framed as half full or half empty. In other words, Framing is those bits of conclusion and judgment about characteristics of what is presented that would go otherwise unnoticed. The second meaning of framing is about the adoption of a particular frame by the audience. As we discussed with Schemata, when people perceive and evaluate a comprehensive set of information, they build a simplified model that summarizes information they have already acquired and conclusions that they have already made. Then, all new information is filtered throughout this model and different components of the situation classified according to it. If the subject is new to a particular concept, the person will cognitively start building a new schemata and process all dependent information they received based on it. While this cognitive process happens within the individual naturally, as they are engaged in critical thinking, 
It is also possible to push that model or frame of reference onto them, where the information is oversimplified and delivered, and later all additional information is streamed to fit and reinforce that particular model. This process of simplification and providing a model is called framing. Now it becomes very clear how this can be exported for an influence operation. By accentuating specific characteristics and suppressing others, we can build a schema in one's mind that aligns with our goals so when critical information is delivered, they will process it in a very specific way that we have predetermined. So let's recap. Agenda setting tells the audience what is the topic and how important it is based on frequency of coverage. Priming sets how the audience will assess information presented to them and prepare certain narratives. And framing accentuates some and suppresses other characteristics in order to shape the information in a particular way to match a particular point of view or established norm. Note that gatekeeping can also be used to tune the frame. Those effects play an essential role in cultivation. Cultivation itself is divided into first and second order effects. The former, also known as memory-based effects, uh, as they heavily depend on the information which is already in the recipient's mind. In those effects, accessibility is critical. In other words, the faster and easier the information can be accessed, the stronger the effect is which means that agenda setting and priming are crucial for the activation of those effects. The second order effects describe how an individual will make a judgment in real time if new information is acquired. This effect can be used for priming by introducing specific information when the person is not able to critically analyze, uh, analyze it by either making it sound unimportant and mention it in passing, or by introducing it at a time when the individual has diminished mental cap uh, capacity or ability to process. Think about a tired person washing dishes while watching TV. Also think about the fast thinking process when it's engaged versus engaging the slow thinking process. Unlike the two-step flow of information, which requires an intermediary, the opinion leader, cultivation is achieved directly, primarily, primarily through saturation is, is agenda setting, priming, and framing. And at the end, we'll summarize all different effects and groups of people they can be applied to. While there is a significant overlap, I have tried to check off the groups whose those, to which those effect applies the most. Gatekeeping pertains to groups and networks as information cannot be hidden from everyone, but some sources are not available to some groups. Two-step flow of information works across all subgroups and individuals as people naturally are influenced by other people. In general, you can see that the individuals are directly influenced by very few of the effects and this shows the inf that influence operations cannot be easily uh, used to act upon a single individual. You will also notice that groups and networks are susceptible to, most of all, to almost all effects. This is because they have characteristics close to the individual, but at the same time, they behave as larger masses of people. Similarly with adversary coalitions, while they're often com comprised of people with, uh, who have high cognitive ability and are aware of those effects, uh, this just shows uh, that they're still people and to a certain extent susceptible to those. And now let's quickly change gears and look into a particular type of operation. But first, who is Yuri Bezmanov, also known as Thomas Schumann? <clears throat> he was a journalist with the Soviet mainstream media, the Novosti or News Press Agency. Or, to be precise, this was his cover job, when indeed he worked for the KGB on subversion operations. He is one of the few detectors that give us an insight into the Soviet era influence operations. The operations Take place, take four steps demoralization, stabilization, crisis, and normalization. While some of those theories come from Germany and the beginning of the century, he gives a really good applied primer on how this is implemented in the real world. He also talks about using the energy of the opponent. Instead of creating something which does not exist, use existing natural tendency and feed them. 
The first stage, demoralization, takes 15 to 20 years, or the time needed to educate one generation and shape up their mind and ideology. In this stage, the societal pillars are attacked. For example, religion is destroyed, ridiculed, and replaced with different codes and beliefs. And uh, education is modified where people are no longer learning um, pragmatic and efficient things like STEM or languages, and instead they're taught natural foods, green energy, home economy, pure sexuality, and so on. In social life, traditional institutions and organizations are replaced with fake ones, and initiative and responsibility is taken away from the people. Power structures are replaced from being comprised of elected individuals to other bodies that are by appointment. Uh, the image of law enforcement and uh, the military is degraded, and he gives an example of how older movies represent those categories very positively, while the newer movies of the 80s, mind you, he passed away in the early 90s, the newer movies of the 80s um, only saw hatred and mistrust to the people that protect us. The second stage, destabilization, continues for two to five years, and once society is demoralized, the focus can be narrowed to just a few things, um, because the others are already in decay. In this pay, uh, phase, human relations are radicalized uh, create, by creating a litigious society and antagonistic one, and the division is further fueled by different NGOs and other subversive organizations. In the third phase, crisis, um, a crisis is created, which can be the result of a massive unrest um, or other factors, and society can no longer function normally. This phase continues up to six weeks. Then the final stage, normalization, settles in. This is when the tanks roll in. This is when the military uh, takes over. In Soviet era, this would be the Russian tanks going in another country and occupying it, uh, helping the oppressed proletariat who were fighting against the oppressors. Um, but very soon it becomes apparent that everybody is oppressed and um, all of those social justice warriors that were uh, facilitating the Russian operations before that would actually be on a hit list and very soon will be uh, exterminated uh, or put in jail. So uh, this is kind of what the um, subversion playbook looks like. Now note that also the term social justice warrior is not something new, it actually comes from that uh, book. So, where am I going with this? Remember, in demoralization and destabilization, we talked about the radicalization of human relationships. Also, remember when I spoke about the echo chambers and how an adversary may need to feed different camps in order to create a greater segregation and polarization in society. Let's look at something we can objectively measure, the division across political party lines. To do uh, this, we'll use the results of a study which has been run repeatedly since 1994 with a sample of over 5,000 people. Here you can see how Democrats and Republicans answered common questions pertaining to government, race, immigration, national security, environmental protection, and other areas, and the changes over years. You can see how the division accelerates and later reaches record levels during the Obama administration and further spreads a little more during the Trump administration. Just FYI, uh, 2017 was the last year when um, this study was uh, ran, so it will be kind of interesting to see wh wh what the results are uh, nowadays. Um, so is this a natural phenomena or is it uh, created uh, by an adversary? Well, let's look at it again and mark the starting medians for both parties and see how their perspective, uh, respective population has changed. Now look at uh, how much each of them changed. Also note how the center moved. It was here, and now it is here. 
Also look at how the blue area has moved so far left, it is close to the boundary and it is almost not present here. Look at its new shape as well. Does this appear natural to you? Or are there nefarious driving forces behind it? I won't give you the answer, but I'll show you where to look. To do so, we'll need to map the different media effects that could create this and see who controls the levers. So let's do some forensics. What does this remind you of? It looks like everyone has mostly the same opinion about all topics and there are a small number of dissenting opinions. What media effects contribute to the lack of dissenting opinions? What is this? Well, this is an echo chamber. How was it created? Well, through agenda setting, gatekeeping, cultivation, and spiral of silence. Now, think about it. Who controls the agenda? Who can apply gatekeeping effectively? Well, you know the answer. You remember uh, and remember what was the mainstream media equivalent uh, for gatekeeping in social networks. Precisely, spiral of silence. This is where your Russian bots may be coming into a play. Now, draw a parallel. Remember the Lazarsfeld drug study I talked about? Remember how all doctors spontaneously started prescribing the same drug due to the exposure to a limited set of information sources. Now, think about mainstream media and the limited number of major networks uh, that are available. Can you see the parallel? Now, that we figured out uh, how this happened and who owns the media uh, effects controls, we should probably investigate who owns the media outlets themselves. Well, but let's leave this to another talk. Now, to summarize, we saw how society has polarized over the past 12 years, how the Democratic Party supporters have significantly moved left, and how, as a result, the center has moved to the left as well. We just looked at the Pew Research Institute study measuring how government, religious observance, national security, education, race and immigration, environment protection, and other areas have changed over the years. Now, let's remember the Bismianov subversion model. What were the pillars attacked during the demoralization phase? Well, exactly. Administration, religion, military and law enforcement, educational system, social life, labor and employer relations. More or less, they overlap. So can we use this study as a measurement of the level of demoralization? Well, probably. Just a reminder, don't confuse the TTPs for the attacker. The fact we call this the Bismianov subversion model doesn't mean that only the KGB is allowed to use it. As a matter of fact, a lot of this theory came from Germany from the beginning of the last century. So it can be implemented by any nation or nation state or privately funded organization. Having said that, you know what the media effects are, you know what the adversary would be attacking in a subversion operation. So start looking at modern news and modern times and see what's being attacked and how similar operations are conducted right now. Happy hunting. Just one note, look for the different pillars that they're attacking and ignore the pretext or the justification that they're using to attack those. And now let's quickly look at a real life example of a campaign. As modern day politics are highly contentious, I'll pick something old and well understood, the weather underground. Wait, 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 wrong logo. This is what happens when you do quick research without fully understanding the topic. This one. The Weather Underground, or the Weatherman, was a subversive communist organization designated by the FBI as a domestic terrorist group. In an attempt to drive their political agenda, they conducted a number of bombings, including against the buildings of the US Capitol, the Pentagon, Department of State building, as well as a number of arsons and riots. Does that sound familiar? They even went as far out uh, to issue a declaration of war against the US government. Their agenda was changing and was changing the social and economic relations 
something that they called institu institutionalized racism, which they never defined, but use the phrase very liberally to mean many things which have nothing to do with skin, color, or race. They have their manifesto called Prairie Fire, which features a highly divisive narrative, framing everything as struggle of the oppressed versus the oppressor, attacking law and order as a construct of imperialism, attacking the family unit as sexist and oppressive, as well as uh, they talk about insurgency, militancy, and other violent means to fulfill their agenda. I highly recommend reading some of the text to see how good intentions are used to frame extremely destructive behavior. Also note, this is not a US-centric problem. This is an example of how narrative can be used to frame any positive belief system into a subversive weapon. So, after this charged topic, let's go back to the proverbial Russian bots. We can't just count those and say, oh well, we have three kilos of bots, therefore it must be that country. We need to understand what the type of the operation is and what they're really after. Is it pure cultivation or are they trying to prime the population for a particular message which will be delivered in a different way? Or are they there to suppress other voices and set the agenda? Are they there to push the diversive uh, narrative? How about ads? Are they there to convince people to vote one way or another? Or we already saw the hypodermic, hypodermic needle theory is not very effective. Could they be there just to set the agenda so we can talk about Russian influence in the election and prime people to think that the elections are rigged? If we answer in the affirmative to the second question, now we are talking about passive information operation. Regardless, without understanding the goals of the campaign, it is not possible to counter it effectively. I hope this talk was interesting and gave you an insight and perspective into the complexities and interdependencies of the human mind and perception. Going back to the Russian bots and the IRA, it is important to understand that the operation was not about buying ads for either of the contenders, but it was rather to spin the narrative so security researchers can talk about how the Russians influenced the elections. This is also called passive information operation, but more on this topic in another talk. As security researchers, we need to be cognizant and aware that we may be the tools of a foreign nation by running a narrative we're influenced to create as a result of findings that are not well understood. Unfortunately, this talk was shortened quite a lot from what I originally planned, so I'll be glad to take any questions in the Q&A session. And also, I would like to invite you to visit the Forces site and read more about uh, more on the subject. Thank you, and I hope to see you soon.